Uh, my name is Dan Yang Zhuo. I'm a six-year PhD student in University of Washington. Today I'm going to talk about how to improve container overlay networks with a little bit of operating system kernel support. This is a joint work with Kai Yuan, Yibo, Hongqiao, Matthew, and my advisor, Arvin and Chang. So as we all know, containers have become very ubiquitous. People use containers to deploy their cache servers, web servers, and databases. And they use their containers to deploy new use cases such as big data, deep learning, and microservices. So what is a container? Container is nothing but another way to do server virtualization. Compared to virtual machine, the container image does not have the operating system inside it. This means on the same server hardware, it can pack much more number of containers than virtual machine, making containers very attractive to deploy distributed applications. Uh, in fact, there was an entire ecosystem in the industry focusing on how to control containers, how to deploy applications using containers. So because this is an SDI, we would like to ask a question, how do containers communicate? Here, there are several um, options. First is that containers can use their host network interface to communicate. So all the containers on the same host will share the IP address of their host operating system. However, this will create a lot of management troubles. For example, if you want to deploy two web servers on the same um, server, uh, server hardware using containers, they cannot bind to the same port. Another option to uh, do container networking is to use what we call Mac VLAN mode or SRLV. So this means you can give a container an independent IP address from the host. However, you, you want to make the container's IP address routable on the host network. This also creates a lot of management trouble because now you have to change the way the routing works in the host network. So the popular option for container networking now is actually to use the overlay mode or to use network virtualization. So this means for a set of containers that want to communicate, you essentially create a virtual network dedicated for that, of, that set of containers. However, this also has some problem. It has really high um, overheads. So in this paper, we want to ask this question. Are the network virtualization overheads actually fundamental? So in this talk, I'm going to cover three points. First, we analyze the existing approach for container network virtualization. What we found is they basically use a scheme which we call packet-based network virtualization. And it indeed triggers really high overheads. And uh, I'll talk about why. And I will talk about our system, which is called Slim. It relies on a completely different way to do network virtualization. We call it connection-based network virtualization. And we make it compatible with Linux kernel applications. We show several case studies using Slim to speed up popular cloud applications. And uh, we can say, uh, see um, up to 56% CPU cycle savings on um, popular cloud applications. So let me first talk about the existing approach to container network virtualization. So what is a container network virtualization? It is essentially to give a set of containers an illusion of they own a dedicated network. So let me give you an example. For example, you can own four containers on two hosts. They are like container A, B, C, D. And they, you can let them run a completely different IP address space, independent from their host. Actually, you can assign any arbitrary IP address to the containers. So how is that possible, right? So here it works like the following. When a con container A wants to send some data to container D, it just writes the container D's IP address uh, on the packet and inject this packet to its host operating system. The host operating system will have this core uh, uh, software called vSwitch or open vSwitch. This Open vSwitch will say this packet cannot be routed on the host network because the host network wouldn't, will not understand the virtual IP address. So let me just encapsulate this packet with a host destination IP. And now the packet can be successfully delivered to the destination host operating system. And the destination ho on, uh, ho uh, op host operating system simply 
trims off the extra host header and delivers this packet to container D. We call this approach packet-based network virtualization because it essentially um, transforms every packet in the virtual network to a packet in the host network by packet encapsulation. So why we deploy this kind of scheme for uh, network virtualization? I mean, it is a very natural way or very naive way to do network virtualization because you simply regard each container as a separate machine. This approach has a lot of performance overheads. So let me show you a simple micro benchmark. So intra here means the two processes are running on the same server hardware. And inter means they're on two different servers connected by a 40G uh, link. So here the numbers are the throughput and the latency. So if you use today's packet-based network virtualization, you will see a slowdown in the throughput and an increase in the latency. And the numbers in the parentheses means the relative slowdown. So you may wonder how much of this is just an implementation issue rather than an architectural issue. So let's just call the system we just measured a vanilla system. We did some improvement to the packet-based scheme they use. So to the people who want to know how do we improve it, it's essentially by packet steering. And we see that we can improve the throughput to almost the same as use the host network directly, but we can cannot improve the latency because as we'll see later, each packet have to hop through a really long pipeline inside the operating system kernel. So there was another piece of overhead is from the CPU cycles. So let's just do a one 10 Gbps TCP connection between two containers. So the vanilla system, we see a 93% increase in the CPU utilization. Even the improved system, we see around 60% increase in CPU utilization. So there was also a high cost in CPU cycles. So let me try to work through why packet-based virtualization has a really high cost. Let's push container D to the very right uh, top corner and eliminate all the unnecessary containers from this picture. Let's take a deep look at what actually happens here. So inside the container A, you will see an application. The application is written with um, using an interface to network, we call it a POSIX socket interface. And the, the container will have a virtual network interface card here, whose IP address is 1.2.3.4. One and the, on the host, it will have a virtual switch and a, a real network interface card, whose IP address is 10.1.2.3. Because the POSIX socket interface is so complex, let me explain this example with a much simpler interface. Only four calls. One start to, to create a, a connection with some target IP address, and to send a buffer, to receive buffer, and to tear down a con network connection. And let me write a very simple application here using this interface. Basically, the application says, let me create a connection to destination 1.2.3.7 and send a buffer which contains ABC inside it and then tear down this connection. Right? So, what so how, how does this work on uh, packet-based virtualization? So I want to tell you that this variable, CON here, is a file descriptor. So a file descriptor means a capability to do stuff on operating system. So in this concrete example, this file descriptor means a, an ability or a capability to send or receive packets to or from container D through this virtual network interface card. So who gave this file descriptor to this application? So there was a core operating system subsystem called network stack. The network stack basically is in charge of tracking different kinds of connection an application has made and uh, to generate packets and also it includes the device driver. So, so when um, the application creates this uh, connection in the connection table inside the network stack, we'll say this is CON file descriptor is nothing but a connection between container A and the container D. So when the application wants to send a buffer ABC, the network stack will understand that it needs to generate packet whose destination IP is the container D's IP. And this packet will travel to the virtual switch to, um, to be encapsulated with the host network uh, headers. And in order to send these packets out 
virtual switch will send this packet back to the net stack in order to run the device driver for the real um, NIC. So as we follow the green arrows here, you will understand why this scheme have a very low throughput, high latency, and high CPU utilization. Because every packet have to hop through a really long pipeline inside the operating system kernel. So next, I will talk about our solution, Slim, which uses a very different way of network virtualization, but we still make it compatible with Linux applications. So let's take a look back at this picture, right? So before, let me, before telling you how Slim works, let me tell you what the goal of Slim is. So the goal here is when the application sends the buffer ABC out, we eliminate the network stack of the virtual network interface. We eliminate the virtual network interface. And we also eliminate the virtual switch on this um, pipeline. We let this buffer directly go through the host network stack. So there were many challenges with uh, this approach, right? But uh, one thing we, we will understand is if this can be done, we simply have the same pipeline as if it is using the host network directly, and we have low latency, high throughput, and uh, very low CPU overheads. So what are the challenges? The first thing is how do we create a virtual network? Because the host network, network stack does not understand what container is. It also does not understand what the IP address of container D or container A is. So how do we give this container an illusion of a dedicated network becomes the first challenge. The second challenge is basically compatibility. How do we work with a modified application? Today, the application is written assuming they have a virtual NIC inside the container. The third challenge is, is now the pipeline is much shorter. It bypassed the virtual switch. How do we enforce network policies that are originally enforced on the virtual network interface card or on the virtual switch? The fourth, cha fourth challenge is security. Now, the application is talking directly to the network stack. So the application can do something like, tell me my own IP address. Should the host network stack return you the container, the host IP address? This seems to be very wrong. So now, let me talk, you, <coughs> talk about how Slim works. So Slim does this. Uh, first, for network virtualization, Slim uses connection-based virtualization. So we implement a process on the host machine called Slim Router. What it does, it translates a connection in the virtual network to a connection in the host network. So when the application wants to create a connection to, connect, uh, to container D, the Slim Router will receive this request. And the Slim Router will say, this connection between container A and container D is nothing but a connection between the two hosts. And it asks the host network stack associated with the physical NIC to create a capability or file descriptor for the application. And now, if the application wants to send a buffer through this file descriptor, the buffer is directly sent to the host network stack and the correct packets with the right physical destination IP are generated. So as we can see here, in the previous packet-based virtualization scheme, we pay a cost at a per packet level. Now we only pay the virtualization cost at a per connection level. So to make this scheme compatible with existing applications, we built a shim layer, which we call Slim Socket. It's basically our implementation of the socket library. We dynamically link this application into uh, this library into the application. So any application written against the socket library will be compatible on our uh, on Slim. So for those of you who actually appreciate the complexity of socket interface, let me show you the same example using real socket interface, right? So this is. Um, uh, somewhat complex to understand, but let me walk through, uh, walk it through. So the two blue boxes on the very side are the containers and the, the applications inside the containers. And the two boxes on the top in the middle are the Slim router. So in the connection setup phase, the Slim router simply imitates what happens inside the container. So when there is a connection set up in the virtual network, a host connection is also set up between the Slim router. And the capability or access to this host connection is granted to the container via a file descriptor. 
So when the application wants to communicate with the file descriptor, the packet simply bypass the virtual switch and go directly through the physical NIC. So there are additional challenges such as how to support network policies. In previously, they can be enforced on the virtual network interface card or on um, the virtual switch. We have to move the informants of net policy to the connection set time, because this is the only place we see destination IP. Um, so we implement this um, functionality in the Slim Router. Basically, you can store a list of access control lists, and uh, when it see it, you can insert a rule saying that reject a connection if the destination IP is equal to some signature, and it will reject a connection at a connection setup time. So another tricky issue is security. So now the file descriptor we give to the application is from the host network stack. And so the application can use some other interface such as get my own IP address or increase my own traffic priority on this file descriptor. So if the application is not malicious, the problem is not very hard. So let me just give an example using get my own IP address. So when the application calls get my own IP address, Slim Socket will basically forward this call to Slim Router. And Slim Router would say your IP address is 1.2.3.4, just to give the container a full illusion of a virtualized network. However, if the application is malicious, it can easily get rid of a dynamic loaded library and issue a direct call into the operating system of get my own IP address using this file descriptor. Um, sent from the host network stack. So we build a defensive um, technique inside the operating system kernel called Slim Kernel Module. It simply tracks the, file the set of file descriptors that is sent by the host network stack into the containers. If the containers trigger an unsafe system call, such as get my own IP address on these kind of file descriptors, the Slim Kernel Module will say this container is malicious and uh, your request is rejected. So now let me walk through like, how Slim performs on real applications and on our micro-benchmark. So for the same micro-benchmark, what we see is Slim basically achieves the exactly same throughput and exactly the same latency as use the host network interface directly. For the CPU side, the x-axis is the CPU through, a TCP throughput. The y-axis is the number of virtual cores consumed. Here is the improved version of packet-based network virtualization. Here is, this line means um, to use the host network interface directly. Slim essentially achieves exactly the same t um, CPU utilization as the, uh, using the host network interface directly. So this is essentially because the data plane of Slim and uh, using the host network interface is not so much different. So we see around a 40% drop in CPU utilization. So how does it perform on real applications? So one benefit I want to point out is that Slim is fully compatible with today's application written against the POSIX socket interface. So we tested four applications, an in-memory key value store, memcached, a web server, Nginx, a database, PostgreSQL, and a stream processing framework, Kafka. And we are using their default benchmarking tool to um, generate workload. So for Memcached, we see a 71% increase in throughput compared with the improved version of, uh, of packet-based network virtualization. And we see a 42% reduction in latency. In terms of CPU utilization, we see around a 25% reduction in CPU utilization at the same time with 71% increase in its throughput. So if you're combining these two effects, the CPU utilization reduction is around 56%. We run the same um, set of experiments on different applications and we see moderate CPU utilization reduction on all of them between 10% to 56%. So now let me tell you what you need to pay in order to get this benefit. So first thing is, connection setup time is much longer. This is because we move all the virtualization costs at ha happens at a per pack level to the connection setup time. So the connection setup time gets 106% longer. 
And we have limited support for packet-based network policy because we do not intercept at every packet for virtualization. We only intercept at connection setup time. We cannot support unmodified low-level network tools, such as TCP dump. If you do a TCP dump on the virtual network interface, you see no packets, because all the packets are, are <coughs> they don't go through the virtual network interface anymore. And we cannot speed up datagram sockets, because we want to see a clear separation of the connection setup time and the data packets in the socket API. So in summary, what I'm showing you is that packet-based network virtualization, which people currently are using, results in high overheads in terms of throughput latency and CPU utilization. And I have demonstrated Slim. Slim essentially integrates efficient network virtualization into the operating system's network stack. Today, operating systems are already very efficient in virtualizing the storage and the compute, leaving the network as the single gap in efficient container virtualization, and Slim simply bridged this gap. Slim is open sourced on GitHub, and I should point out that I'm an academic job market, so if you want to talk to me, we should talk later. Uh, I'm open to any questions. Thank you very much. Hi, Chris Kuzirak is Google Cloud and Stanford. Uh, great work, congratulations. I wonder if you can uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how Slim compares in the racks uh, or works with uh, all the industry efforts to basically proxy everything, with things like Istio for containers, or try to, they try to do similar things by virtualizing the system call interface, or with the socket interface by one level lower. For example, the app switch uh, from up or bit if I remember correctly, the company. So there's a lot of effort in proxying stuff one way or another. Have you looked a little bit into that, and what are the differences? Yeah, so I, I, um, I'm, um, I'm not very familiar with how proxy works and uh, not familiar with the software you're talking about. But yeah, but uh, my understanding is um, if you are able to create a TCP connection between the two containers, we are able to speed that up for you. Because uh, and, uh, another requirement is you need to have the ability to create a direct TCP connection on the host. So if the proxy um, software you're talking about needs, uh, creates a, a TCP connection between the two containers and also their host, you can establish a connection in their host, I mean, their, um, then Slim can essentially make it more efficient. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the. Uh, hi, thanks for the interesting talk. Danny Chen from Princeton University. So I wonder if it's true that your system cannot support more than 65,000 containers per host because you run out of ports on the host. Oh, what? Sorry, I mean, TCP only supports 65,000 ports. Right, because right. Because mi microservice is getting popular these days. It might be the case that one server, will ha one host will have more than 65,000 containers. So right. in this case, would it, it would be an issue for you? Yes, I understand your concern. So basically, <coughs> in, on Slim, every connection inside the host, you have to have a correspondent connection on the host itself, right? So mm -hmm. this can explode because the number of ports are limited on the operating system for a given IP address. So if that's a concern, um, we can create multiple physical IP in the host operating system. And then you can basically uh, still do Slim-like stuff. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Nodir from UBC. Interesting work, uh, especially you covered limitations. Yeah. Uh, everything except the scalability. So with uh, OVS, yep. Open Virtual Switch, I can uh, like run lots of containers. But do you have the scalability limitations in your solution, uh, like Slim versus OVS? Um, I don't think there is a fundamental scalability limitations. Uh, the reason is um, like the extra state we're maintaining is basically uh, in the Slim router. The Slim router, you need one Slim router per container. That's like a per container cost. And the Slim router basically need to maintain a connection states. Um, basically, it is a mapping between a connection in the virtual network to a connection in the host network. So uh, it is some, you have to pay a fixed cost per connection. Um, and uh, I don't see why that is um, not scalable. OK, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah. Hi, a small question. Uh, how would this work with the uh, container migration? Right. So, uh, uh, um, so uh, for container migration, there were two types of migration. One is what we call um, code migration. This means you essentially shut down the container and reboot it from uh, somewhere else. And uh, 
um, SLIM support this kind of migration. So here is the performance results. Um, um, basically, what we found is Slim does not um, decrease the migration type much. Uh, here, like Weave is the, a packet-based network virtualization scheme. Um, so another type of migration you're talking about is live migration, which means you want to keep the kernel states, keep all the file descriptors open and migrate to the container. So to, to my best of knowledge, uh, Docker is trying to experiment that approach, but uh, I don't think that is um, mature yet today because you can understand why it is difficult. You kind of need to migrate the kernel state without the kernel inside the container image, right? Um, so I think if live, live migration um, can be done in the future um, and it's mature enough to be um, slim, then will make it more difficult because uh, now you have to basically migrate a map mapping between the virtual network to, and to the host network with the container, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Let me one, uh, one more quick question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, could you give us a sense for how much of the CPU savings occurs in the context of the container versus how much is saved in the context of the host kernel? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the reason why. I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out whether you're paying a lot of OVS costs that might be reduced by switching to something like FDIO as, as the underlying um, you know, host networking uh, right. uh, software. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so I don't have a, a detailed uh, um, breakdown of how much is the like uh, uh, the o OVS or the virtual NIC or the extra traverse of the network stack. But you you can see like uh, if you want to do um, packet-based network virtualization, I mean this you have to, fundamentally you have to pay the cost of packet transformation. Um, you can offload it to hardware to have all these kind of um, ways to make it slightly faster and less overhead, but uh, the cost is kind of fundamental. Yeah. Can you take it offline? Yeah. Right, let's sing the speaker one more time.